You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from theheart.org, Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for March 1st, 2019. This week, I'm talking lead extraction, atrial fibrillation triggers, cognitive decline, low-value care, and secondary prevention therapies in the real world. First up is lead extraction. So extraction of pacing or ICD leads is sometimes necessary, but it's always serious. It's one of those skills that a robot will never take over. It requires training, feel, and a bit of guts. Why guts? Because pacing leads can become scarred into the body, and removing them from the heart or SVC risks tearing things. You have to push, pull, laser, just enough, but not too much. Mayo Clinic researchers set out to answer a pretty simple question, and that is, is there a way to predict high and low risk cases so that low risk cases can be done in the EP lab rather than a more expensive uh, operating room? They used their experience over three years, about 350 leads removed from 187 patients in the EP lab and operating theater. They report high success rates in either place, but a higher incidence of major complications occurred in the high-risk group, operating room group, about 7%, and in a device laboratory, 0%. Now, in an editorial my friend Nigel Lever smartly points out what this data shows. A surgical team is not needed when a complication does not occur. But what we don't know is how infrequent does the risk of a complication have to become before you can do the procedure in an EP lab without a surgical team on the ready. It's kind of like the old days of PCI. There was always a surgeon in the room when we did angioplasty. Now, rarely does one even think of having surgical backup. I like this Mayo study, not so much because it's definitive, because it gets American doctors thinking about elite extraction. As Dr. Rob Schaller from University of Pennsylvania, who's also a friend of mine, said in our news story, we really should have a registry of lead extractions. This could be, this could tell us a lot about how to stratify risks. Imagine instead of A couple hundred patients like the Mayo study, we had data from thousands of people. Now, the other reasons I like to discuss lead extractions is that it brings up the notion of asymmetry of risk. What I mean by asymmetry is that even though the absolute risk of a complication from a lead extraction is very low, the results of that complication could be catastrophic. Now, this means a clinician has to be skilled both in and out of the lab. You got to have amazing preparation before the procedure, good discussions with the patient, and you have to think about the need for extraction versus abandoning the old leads. Finally, another aspect of lead extraction today is its popularity. A few years ago, a city might have one or two extractors. Now, companies that make the equipment to do extractions are training doctors to do the procedure, and it's similar to AF ablation. I think we may be approaching a point where most extractions in the U.S. are done by low-volume operators. And while this improves access for patients, I'm not sure it's a good thing to have such a nuanced, potentially dangerous procedure done in low-volume centers by low-volume operators. So yet another question we need to think about and discuss concerning lead extraction is how to ensure the procedure is done in experienced hands at experienced centers. Now here, I bet my Canadian friends might have some useful suggestions. Next topic is AFib triggers. So AF episodes often start with a trigger, say a big meal, wine, a training ride, an emotionally stressful event. But AF episodes often occur without a trigger. So I've often wondered whether there were any patterns, because if there were patterns, well, that would be good to know. So researchers from the UCSF invited patients with symptomatic PAF from the Health eHeart study and participants from the StopAFib.org web organization to take a survey. About 1,300 patients did, and three in four patients reported having triggers for AF. 
those reporting triggers for their AF had a lower incidence of heart failure. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because it's asymptomatic AFib that often gets people into trouble with AF. Patients with triggers also had a higher odds of having a family history of AFib, and I've seen that a lot too. The common triggers were alcohol, caffeine, exercise, and lack of sleep. The good news was that the majority of triggers are modifiable. Senior author Greg Marcus pointed out the main downside, though, and that is there are there is lots of heterogeneity regarding the perceived triggers, and that makes it hard to have a catch-all recommendation. Now, one notable aspect of this survey was that caffeine was reported as a trigger. And I hear that often too, but what is weird is that no population study or RCT has shown caffeine associates with or causes arrhythmia. Obviously, though, some individuals are sensitive to it, so this is kind of a good example of how studies measure average effects, but single individuals are sometimes not like the average person. Finally, here is yet another, yet another sobering study on atrial fib. And it shows us how little we know about this common condition. Next topic is the HOPE 3 cognition study. Now, I like to discuss the elderly on this podcast because their illnesses often don't have a month or a campaign. For instance, there's no Go Red for Frailty month. Now, that's too bad because unlike the millions of well people who get made into patients by lower thresholds for diseases, say pre-hypertension or pre-diabetes, The elderly actually have real diseases. So this week, HOPE3 investigators published the results of their blood pressure and lipid-lowering trial for cognition. Recall that the main HOPE3 trial was a 2 by 2 primary prevention RCT looking at blood pressure therapy and lipid-lowering for cardiovascular outcomes. But the cognition arm had about 23 individuals. Neurology published this study. Now, the short story is easy. Long-term blood pressure lowering with candesartan plus HCTZ, rosuvastatin, or their combination did not, did not significantly affect cognitive decline in older people. I like the HOPE 3 trial. It's a great study. It would have been fabulous if better cognition uh, was achieved as simply as having slightly better blood pressure and cholesterol numbers, but it is not. Primary prevention meds in intermediate risk people have very small effects. Reducing non-fatal events is one thing, but improving something as vast as cognition will not be so easy. Now, here are two other things to consider about cognitive decline. Slowing cognitive decline will be a lot like improving health in general. The big gains won't come from interventions with meds or procedures, but will come with healthier communities, which is society's, not medicine's, job. The other thing to say about cognitive decline, like organ function decline, is that it's part of the natural order of human existence. We get old and we wear out. In his must-read recent book, Can Medicine Be Cured?, Irish gastroenterologist Dr. Seamus O. Mahoney wonders whether we would not all be better off if we accepted that living a really long life has some downsides. For instance, if we had that frame of reference, maybe then, Doctors would be better able to provide palliation, and perhaps patients would be more accepting of palliative measures at the end of life. Next topic is low-value care. Now, I've read Danny Kahneman's Fast and Slow Thinking at least three times, so I know I should not believe in superstition. But it sure seems to me that when I get pushed into doing a procedure that I feel is low-value, and don't ask, it happens sometimes, the chance of complications are higher. Now, a study published in JAMA Internal Medicine from researchers in Sydney, Australia, suggests that these gut feelings about low-value care may actually be true. This group studied the rate of hospital-acquired complications in patients admitted for low-value procedures. It was a cohort observational study of almost 10,000 episodes of admissions for low-value procedures. Now, you might wonder what these low-value procedures are, and they're like endoscopy for dyspepsia in people younger than age 55, or knee arthroscopy for arthritis or meniscal tears. 
uh, endovascular repair of abdominal aortic aneurysms in asymptomatic high-risk patients, carotid endarterectomy in asymptomatic high-risk patients, renal artery angioplasty and spinal fusion for uncomplicated low back pain, for instance. Now, the authors measured harm by noting the presence of HACs, or hospital-acquired complications, and there were a number of them. For instance, pressure injuries, falls, infections, reoperations, GI bleeding, and there's a long list. The statistics are descriptive. There is no control group in the study because patients receiving recommended care do not appear in data. Hospital-acquired complications range from as low as 0.1% for endoscopy to as high as 15% for endovascular aortic aneurysm repair. Carotid endarterectomy complication rate was 7.7% and renal artery PCI was 8.5%. You know, here's the main point of this study. Reducing low-value care is not only about reducing costs. It's also about reducing harm or iatrogenesis. I also highlight this study because it's a rare example where a control group is not needed. And this is obviously because if you're doing a procedure that has no benefit, you need only to describe the harms. Final topic today is, does receiving secondary prevention measures lead to better outcomes? Now, that seems like a silly tagline because we have RCTs that show that statins and ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, when used for secondary prevention, improves outcomes. But what about the real world? Now, in the real world here in the U.S., we have Medicare, and we also have Medicare Advantage, which allows those in Medicare to enroll in private insurance plans rather than traditional fee-for-service. And then Medicare Advantage pays a lump monthly sum for treating patients and it incentivizes performance for evidence-based care with financial bonuses paid for high adherence to guideline-driven care. And indeed, uh, Medicare Advantage is, is growing because, I think, probably because of better drug coverage. So Harvard researchers used data from a pinnacle registry, and they found that patients enrolled in Medicare Advantage were more likely, more likely to receive guideline-recommended secondary prevention treatments when they were eligible. However, the authors found no differences in intermediate outcomes between patients enrolled in Medicare Advantage and fee-for-service Medicare, and that included blood pressure and cholesterol levels. Hmm, this is interesting. JAMA Cardiology published a study, and in an editorial, Stanford cardiologist Paul Heidenreich cautioned not to make too much of the lack of outcome data because it's an observational registry study. And I'd second that on the grounds that We actually use Pinnacle data and we plug it into our EHR as part of our normal workflow, and I doubt that this data has much precision. Nonetheless, this study does make me think about two things. One is the difference between receiving secondary prevention meds and getting better outcomes in the real world. So patients in the real world may not be like those carefully selected patients in clinical trials. The second thought I had concerns how we measure quality. Perhaps it would be better to measure only outcomes rather than the receipt of this or that medication. Because here's the thing, experienced clinicians will testify that one way to help some people achieve better outcomes is actually to help them avoid evidence-based medications. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And again, if you like this podcast, please consider subscribing, giving us a review or a five-star rating, and that way other people can find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.